It's day, October 11th, 2023, afternoon session of the Portland City Council. Good afternoon. Keelan, please call the roll. Good afternoon. Maps. Rubio. Here. Ryan. Gonzalez. Here. Wheeler. Here. We'll hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Welcome to the Portland City Council. Testify before council in person or virtually. You must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct, such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. Thank you. All right, first up today is item 863, a non-emergency ordinance. Grant residential solid waste collection franchises in the city of Portland. Colleagues, good afternoon. Our first item on today's agenda is to renew residential solid waste collection franchises in the city of Portland. I'll now hand it over to Commissioner Rubio, the commissioner in charge of the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability to walk us through this item. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. Colleagues, six months ago, we voted to initiate the Residential Waste Collection Franchise Review. Today, we will be presented with recommendations for a revised franchise agreement with a new term. Since 1992, Portland's franchise system for residential garbage and recycling has allowed the city to ensure that our haulers provide consistent, reliable service at a consistent city-approved price. Portlanders generated more than 211,000 tons of waste from the res residential system last year, representing about 27% <coughs> of the waste of our community. Collecting this material is a critical service, and we are here today to discuss how the city can continue to evolve and improve its service, which I believe is best done by extending our term with our franchise haulers with a revised franchise agreement. Operating under a franchise system offers a number of key benefits to our city, and I'd like to call attention to a number of them. First, the ability to set rates. Also, increased collaboration with haulers. It also allows us to blend the strengths of private sector competition with leadership from the public sector, and it has allowed us to recover more material for recycling and composting. Since the inception of the franchise, we have diverted an increasing percentage of that waste for recycling, most recently 63% of it. We are going to continue the work that improves our system and ensures that it continues to align with our values. This proposed agreement before us largely keeps our current system intact while proposing improvements to keep in alignment with our values and guiding principles. And some highlights of those improvements are looking ahead at the implementation of the Re Recycling and Modernization Act in which producers of packaging will be <coughs> investing in communities and sharing the cost of better recycling. Also increasing our attention to customer service performance um, by using more tracking and reporting measures and also continuing to find ways within the franchise system to encourage opportunities for emerging and COVID businesses. And then also requiring all haulers to provide health care coverage. So to further walk us through this proposed agreement, I'll now turn it over to BPS Director Donnie Oliveira to begin the presentation. Thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council. Afternoon. Don Oliveira, Director for BP, uh, Bureau of Planning and Sustainability for the record. Uh, all right, we've got the slides up. Um, <clears throat> we're here today to um, share the conclusions of the review process that Commissioner Rubio outlined that we completed on the residential waste collection system over the last six months. We brought a revised and updated agreement um, proposed for adoption by council. Let's start with some good news. Uh, Portland continues to boast a world-class residential collection system, and this is in large part due to the partnership we have with our franchisees. 
And you'll see this re franchise review process that we confirmed through uh, high levels of, of surveys and outreach that we continue to boast um, high quality service for our customers. And that's again, in large part due to our great um, hauler uh, base. Um, but we do have some recommendations for your consideration. The truth is we are not proposing any major pivots to the system. This was really refinements opportunity because why would we mess with a high functioning system that we have today? So the recommendations before you are gonna talk about um, addressing some low hanging fruit opportunities to support our haulers, their employees, um, and improve the system um, going forward. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the agenda. I just wanna walk through this because I also wanna uh, capture what we're not gonna be um, covering today. So first we're gonna recap um, um, why council voted to initiate a review process in March and the scope of that review. We'll also set out um, you know, the agreement with the haulers and how we went about that process. We'll share what we heard from our community engagement and have those discussions um, daylit for you as well. Next, we're gonna walk through two groups of recommendations from the review process. The first set of recommendations are within the proposed revised agreement that you're considering today. Um, and those would be implemented by um, BPS and haulers accordingly. These are recommendations um, that are within the franchise agreement and will allow us to um, advance those uh, most um, expediently. The second set is a group of recommendations that emerge from the review, but that will be more appropriate uh, for implementation through administrative rule or code, which BPS um, will do separately after the franchise or if the franchise agreement is adopted. Okay, and then we'll discuss next steps about that as well. I also wanna take a moment to acknowledge um, what is not included in this franchise agreement. As a reminder, um, this agreement only covers services delivered to customers in one to four unit residences. Collections for businesses, multifamily, and even the unhoused are not governed by this agreement. If this agreement is adopted, BPS policy staff will then turn our attention to a long overdue evaluation of the multifamily and commercial services of our city. It is my commitment and that of staff that every resident and business um, should have this, uh, access to the same service levels and we'd like to get there soon. This agreement um, also does not directly impact illegal dumping or cleanup programs. BPS continues to coordinate with our colleagues with the impact reduction program in Metro and is continually looking at ways to support cleaner streets. Um, we also remain committed to continually financing those programs along with our allotted public trash program. But those programs again are not covered in this franchise agreement. And then last regarding rates. Given our shared concerns over costs for residents, we are not proposing any changes to the franchise system that will drive major cost increases. In fact, we are currently weighing in with the state as rules are adopted for the Recycling Modernization Act to push the rules that ensure that the value of the new recycling investments from producers of packaging are realized by our customers to help keep our recycling costs affordable. In that same vein, I also wanna highlight that we continue to research a long-term solution for a low-income program that we'll bring to council next year. So council will have um, direct involvement in the adoption of a low income program if we were to do that. And last but not least, I really get an opportunity to uh, send thanks, but I wanna take a moment to thank the uh, Portland Haulers Association and their haulers and the employees of those haulers associations. So thank you, Aero, Elmers, Waste Management, Republic, Hyberg, PDR, Recology Sunset, Wacker and Walker. Thank you so much for their service. They truly uh, provide stout commitment to service excellence and a continued service uh, standard that is truly world class. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Evan Polk, to walk you through the franchise proposal. Thank you, Donnie. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and commissioners. My name is Evan Polk and I am BPS's Solid Waste and Recycling Manager. I wanted to appreciate uh, Donnie recognizing our haulers. Uh, they do truly go above and beyond. Just uh, a couple weeks ago, we were looking at a video of a driver uh, early in the morning, hopping out of their truck, grabbing a fire extinguisher and, and putting out a fire in, uh, on the, off the sidewalk in, in downtown. Uh, and so uh, just, you know, things like that happen fairly often and, and we appreciate their presence in the community. So here's kind of the top line for why we're here in March. You initiated a review of the residential collection system as envisioned in the existing agreement with the haulers. And so we collected feedback from the community, our haulers and COVID companies in the waste arena. And putting those two things together, we're proposing changes based on a review and discussions and feedback. Those changes have been incorporated into the franchise agreement that's under consideration today. Next slide. So just as a reminder, we have nine waste haulers serving just over 160,000 households in our community. Again, that's, uh, that's a franchise system that serves single family houses up to four plexes. 
This system is operated under franchise since 1992, which, as the commissioner already noted, um, allows us to set consistent rates and services that are intended to benefit our community at a broad scale. Next slide, please. So we use the guiding principles that council adopted in March as, uh, as, a, a, as basically a roadmap for this review process. And with those guiding principles in hand, we provided multiple engagement opportunities within our community with current franchised companies and COVID companies uh, to develop, develop the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the franchise agreement that's in front of you today. I'm going to talk, talk a little bit about the purpose of the franchise review and how it fits in with our overall system of governing uh, collection services in the city. Next slide, please. <coughs> so as a reminder of the, the context that this review sits within, there's a few components to our collection system governance. We use city code, administrative rule, and the franchise agreement, which is adopted by ordinance. The franchise agreement currently is an 18-page document that acts as the sort of high-level terms and conditions under which the city authorizes our haulers to deliver residential garbage and recycling collection in their defined territories. So most of the rules governing the collection service, you know, day-to-day -day services are actually found in our administrative rules. That's where we say when and how service must be provided under what types of conditions. The franchise agreement <coughs> requires that our franchised collectors or haulers uh, abide by those rules. It also requires haulers to serve all their customers in a designated territory. It lays out the methodology used in our annual rate review process, for example, by identifying the types of costs that we will in, uh, consider when we set those rates every year. The franchise agreement also recognizes the fee that we receive <coughs> to fund waste and recycling system management and the programming that is required by the state, as well as uh, the target operating profit margin for the haulers. The franchise agreement also includes a process by which the city can review the franchise and, if it so chooses, make some changes and then extend the term another five years. And that's exactly the, the piece of the process that we're wrapping up today. <coughs> Next slide, please. So the franchise review is an opportunity to ensure that the franchise agreement is still helping the city meet our goals to provide high quality garbage recycling and composting collection that is reliable, cost-effective, sustainable, and equitable. It's an opportunity to continue evolving the system to provide more value to our community. It's not the process for reviewing individual companies to determine if they're worthy of maintaining a franchise. Uh, this is a system-wide review. It's also distinct, as Donnie mentioned, from our annual fee review process that takes place every spring. There are a number of things we can take a look at as we do a franchise review, context, including indicators of performance, feedback from customers, comparative analyses, and uh, a discussion and review of, of how the services can evolve to, to remain in the public interest. The franchise agreement identifies a window of time in which a midterm review can be conducted, and we're currently in that window. In this case, the city council initiated the review in March, and under the review process spelled out within the franchise agreement, we have to come back within six months and tell you what happened. So that's what we're here to do today. Uh, the review can either result in an updated franchise agreement that the city council may consider and adopt, which would also result in a new 12-year term. Um, we're only in five years into the current 12-year term, so initiating a new term has the effect of extending it by five years. Next slide, please. <coughs> uh, I apologize, next slide again. So as mentioned, the city's franchise agreement has a term of 12 years, and the timeline for the current franchise agreement is identified by the upper green line on your slide. That agreement expires in 2031. Right now, we are at the end of the little uh, window identified by the red arrows, marked as a six-month review process. So the midterm review has been conducted uh, regularly since the inception of the franchise in 1992, and extension of the franchise uh, has occurred at every review point in the past. If the council chooses, chooses to adopt the recommended franchise agreement, we'll shift to that lower blue timeline on your slide, where there will be a new 12-year term that extends the franchise out by another five years to 2036 instead of 2031. 
uh, with the new franchise term, the city can conduct, conduct another review in 2028, basically five years from now. If we do not renew it, the franchise agreement would expire in 2031. Next slide, please. This slide is simply a reminder of the guiding principles that Council adopted in March when we set forth on this review process. They are to advance sustainability and climate goals, ensure cost-effective, safe, and environmentally sound operations, provide exemplary customer service, and develop an equitable and resilient system. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next several slides are a summary of the engagement that we've conducted within the community and with our haulers. Next slide, please. We conducted a community-wide survey asking customers if they were satisfied with their service overall and also asking them questions about specific elements of their service, such as their haulers' customer service responsiveness. We were extremely pleased to receive over 5,000 responses, which is a very high response rate for a city survey, I understand. Community members were notified of the survey in several ways. Uh, all customers covered by the franchise system received the June issue of Curbsider, which announced the review process and included a link to the webpage. Staff tabled at events, including Good in the Hood, Juneteenth, and Northeast Sunday Parkways. All customers who were signed up for our Garbage Day Reminders app or notification tool, that's 40,000 customers, they were sent a notification and a link to the survey. And then uh, uh, also some garbage haulers helped by sending an email to their customers with an invitation to take the survey. It was available in English, Spanish, Vietnamese, and simplified Chinese. Next slide, please. I'll tell you, we saw a lot of comments like those here on this slide appreciating the work that our collectors do. Um, a number of people in our community are grateful for the service they receive, think it's done well, and appreciate the presence of their collectors in the community. Next slide, please. 89% of respondents said they were satisfied with service, with 59% of those saying they were very satisfied. This is one of the reasons why we're recommending a relative sense of continuity in the system by extending the franchise agreement. Next slide, please. We also saw that satisfaction was high specifically for customer service responsiveness and effectiveness of customer service response by haulers. And satisfaction was high with respect to hauler communications, whether that's on the bill or other communications from the hauler. Next slide, please. We did, I, we did see some opportunities for improvement. One area of opportunity for improvement was that we had some customers tell us that uh, weather, day, weather delay communications from uh, their haulers could be more reliable and consistent. I think something like 14% of the, of the customer base felt that that would be helpful. We also uh, saw that there would, there's some variability in the degree to which haulers resolve customer service issues. And so uh, this is why we have some customer service recommendations for the franchise agreement to try to um, basically generate some greater consistency in customer service performance across the system. And we also found that we could probably do a better job explaining why we have every other week garbage service and options and the options for cart sizes because Portland's uh, not alone in having every other week garbage service, but it's rare enough that we have uh, you know, community members uh, join our community and uh, wonder why. <clears throat> there was also relatively a little awareness that haulers can pick up bulky waste items, so we're gonna do a better job making sure that uh, customers are aware of that service. Next slide, please. During this project, staff reached out to COVID firms on the state's list of companies in the solid waste arena. Portland already requires existing franchisees who want to sell their franchise to notify these companies uh, and, and provide a 90-day notification period before proceeding with a sale. That is uh, a measure that's intended to open the door for uh, new entrants potentially in the system. In the prior franchise review, Neither franchise haulers nor COVID companies were really interested in subcontracting to provide collection service, but that review did result in the collection of demographics for our hauler workforce and also the identification of other avenues that the city has been using to open up new business opportunities in waste for emerging or COVID companies, such as public trash collection contracts. 
As a result of this review, the proposed franchise agreement would be amended to acknowledge and encourage expanded opportunities for, for new and emerging businesses in contracting with haulers for ancillary and supporting services. Next slide, please. We also conducted several engagement sessions directly with our existing franchised residential haulers. Over those sessions, we explored questions such as, what's working well about the current system? What can be improved? How can we reflect the guiding principles that the council adopted in March better in our system? And at council's request, I just wanna highlight that we also set aside some time to discuss our system's role in enhanced recycling collection services. So by this, I'm referring to the subscription-based services provided by newer entities like James Recycling and Ridwell. And we'll share a little bit about the outcome of that conversation. Next slide, please. So in the next section of slides, we're gonna to pivot to summarizing the recommendations that emerged from community and stakeholder engagement. Next slide, please. We're gonna start with recommendations that pertain specifically to the franchise agreement. So we wanna highlight our primary recommendation for today, which is that we renew the franchise agreement with proposed amendments. This would result in extending the franchise term by another five years and extend the possibility of another review in five years, or if the city reviews commercial collection services, we could also trigger another review of the residential system in order to promote a coherent review. So that's our top line finding and recommendation. Next slide, please. We have a number of recommendations that we propose to uh, implement within the franchise agreement along the guiding principles that we used for the review process. And I'll just pause on this slide for a moment and explain a little bit about some of those proposed changes. Again, these are all recommendations that are actually incorporated into the franchise agreement itself. First, we amended the agreement to recognize the Plastic Pollution and Recycling Modernization Act and the need for haulers to work with the city for us to work together to implement its provisions in coming years. This is gonna result in a significant amount of investment from producers into the recycling system in our state. And we have an opportunity to collaborate with haulers to make sure that the value of that investment is something that uh, shows up in our community and helps to, for example, defray recycling costs that our residents are paying. Guiding, under guiding principle number two, there's a couple changes we propose to make. One is to extend the city's renewable fuel standard to cover trucks that are providing garbage and recycling collection and service in Portland. As you know, the renewable fuel standard is the result of, of good work by uh, other portions of, of our bureau, and we saw that opportunity to extend those provisions into our collection system. We also are going to take the time to, or we're proposing our, some amendments that would I'll better align our franchise system with Oregon public records law. In consultation with our attorneys, we found that uh, our city's, the, the policy in the franchise agreement was a little out of date. Uh, this, is, this really affects the documents that we request from the haulers in order to review their costs and then set fair and reasonable rates. And so we wanted to update uh, how, how our franchise agreement speaks to those records. Guiding principle number three, we want to acknowledge the importance of excellent customer service for all franchise haulers, including performance tracking and reporting. So we've added a, a subsection to the franchise agreement that for the first time explicitly acknowledges the importance of customer service. Under guiding principle number four, developing an equitable and resilient system, we are amending the franchise agreement to incorporate provisions that um, would facilitate the management of a potential low income qualifying reduced fee for garbage and recycling service. As Donnie mentioned, that is a fee that would be brought potentially to city council later uh, in the coming months, next year. But we needed to lay the groundwork uh, should council choose to adopt such a fee uh, so that the franchise is ready for it. And finally, we're uh, amending the franchise to encourage opportunities for new and emerging and COVID contractors and suppliers and vendors through subcontracting and uh, the provision of ancillary services within, within the system. Last thing under guiding principle number four, we want to require all franchisees to participate in planning and preparing for interruptions and disasters. 
This is something that only the larger haulers have had to participate in, and we want to broaden that participation. And finally, you'll note on the slide that there were some housekeeping amendments uh, to the franchise that emerged from consultation with our attorneys, and also to align the franchise agreement with the franchise fee that council adopted earlier this year. Next slide, please. So those were the recommendations that are reflected in the franchise agreement under consideration today, but we wanted to share the additional recommendations that have come out of this engagement process. The next few slides show those. Uh, those are recommendations that really don't belong in the franchise agreement, which is a high-level document, but it would be appropriate for us to incorporate into administrative rules or city code. And we're beginning an administrative rule amendment project uh, just right now, really, uh, that we intend to conclude early next year, and that's going to be an opportunity to implement several of these recommendations. Next slide, please. So we've organized these, again, by the guiding principles. Under guiding principle number one, we are proposing to do a little bit more to make customers aware of the availability of bulky waste services and harmonize rates and service expectations across all of our haulers improve the tracking and reporting of collection, and evaluate the potential for some bulky waste collection to be included in the monthly cost of regular residential service. That's not a commitment that we would do that, uh, but that we would evaluate that, that opportunity. We also want to collect data on participation levels in residential food scraps, and consider new recycling options, such as exploring the addition of household batteries to curbside recycling collection. Under number two, I want to note that uh, we're proposing to. Commissioner Ryan had a question. I could also wait yes, till the end. I just realized I could wait till the end. Okay. And yet, pausing here also makes sense. Okay. I think this is a really great slide. Could you please ask if yep. you have a question? Okay, great. Um, so, what I hear from neighbors, including my spouse, um, what about when? How long is it going to take for us to get to having we have batteries somewhere? Is that your number one frequently? Is your question, how long will it take for us to get a battery service? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's so important. Obviously, we're moving more and more to electrification, so everyone yeah. has more batteries. And not it, everyone, is it right, Dale? Not everyone feels like they want to spend more money on accessing another vendor. Correct. So I think it's really out of convenience. I'm telling you everything you already know, but I think there's some urgency around that. OK. Don't you agree? Well, for battery collection, so in our system, we would, we would consider the addition of new materials on a case-by-case -case basis, and batteries is one that's emerged as, a, as an excellent opportunity because we think we can collect that material without a significant cost increase. And uh, we also know that our community is interested in it. Uh, it would be unfair of me to commit to any particular timeline because in our conversations with our haulers, we have not identified exactly when that would be feasible. Uh, but my hope would be that it would be, you know, potentially within the next year or less. I understand the risk of putting out dates. <laughs> um, <so, laughs> I'm warming us up for the next item. Um, so anyway, I, what I heard is that you have some urgency on this issue as well. It's just the number one thing you hear out from everyone. Yes, and we'll, we'll describe in a later slide uh, our discussion about okay. these third-party um, enhanced recycling services. And food scraps diversion, what does that mean? We allow and have for, for many years now the opportunity for residents to put their food waste in their yard debris bin. Right. And uh, one of the things that we realized in our conversations was that it's just been a while since we assessed what the participation levels in that are. No. Oh. And it's called food scraps diversion. Okay. Diversion from going into a landfill. Diversion from the landfill into a, a more okay. sustainable. I mean, pathway. I was raised with a dad who did organic farming before anyone knew what it was, so I get the whole, you know, compost pile thing. Yes. Okay. You know what? I'm waking up to this topic. You know, it's usually when you talk about hauling right after lunch, it kind of takes a while. But I think I'm hitting on some points that Portlanders really can find relatable. So. Thanks Glad to hear for that. Entertaining my questions. Of course. Gonzalez had a question as well. Yeah, uh, actually, just building off the food scrap diversion, so I'm trying to visualize what we're really saying here. So, is this a reevaluation right. of whether we compost food scraps? No. Okay, so then what would be, so it would be a third? So, right now, you. No, you sir. Got, okay. 
we would just be collecting additional data on on the use of the service within our community. Got frankly. it. But what would the what what operational change would you envision on that? Just so I can fast forward a view. No operational changes. Oh, okay. The service is available, and uh, we want to encourage its use. Commissioner, this may result in, let's say, a new outreach program. Let's say we're not doing a, a, a solid enough job on letting you know residents know what they can put in the bin. So, for example, we might be saying, "Oh, you're, we noticed, you know, that you're putting your, you know, your meat in the black bin. You can actually, it can go in your green bin." So it's just an opportunity for us to evaluate how people are interacting with the system and what we can do to encourage higher participation. Got it. And the. And then going up a level, so we have guiding principle one and guiding principle two. Are these, I mean, are those hierarchical? Is guiding principle number one the most important thing? Or what, just, no. how does this frame up when we're thinking about a system? I, and I'm sorry, I had to step out for a moment earlier in your report. No, so that, I great question. Maybe lacking context here. Yeah, but. the guiding principles are sort of just by what framework would we look at this whole system? It's a very complex system. There's a lot of things to consider when you're looking at a, a collection system. So we really just did this in sort of a way for us to compartmentalize the different types of elements of a system that we might consider um, evaluating trash collection, recycling collection, organics collection on. So in this particular case on slide 23, we have the first two that are focused around sustainability and the cost effectiveness of the system on guiding principles three and four, which is the next slides. It's oh, just another bucket. So got it. Yeah. Maybe if, I'll hold my question until we get yeah. to the next slide then. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, then why don't we move to the next slide? So guiding principle three is about providing exemplary customer service. Next slide, please. There it is. So here are a few things that we propose to do. And again, these are actions that we would take not within the franchise agreement itself, but through uh, changes to administrative rule in coming months. So for example, we uh, propose to develop a consistent tracking and reporting methodology for customer service calls and complaints across haulers so that we can compare that information. We know when customers call their hauler with a concern, we want them all to be tracking that in a consistent way so that we can compare their performance and, uh, and, and identify opportunities for improvement. Um, and so we're gonna require some periodic customer service reporting. We want to update expectations for customer service staffing and phone lines and payment methods because those administrative rules speak only to the existence of phones and we know that customer service now is provided through a number of ways including apps and uh, other, uh, other tools and so we want to recognize the availability of other, other customer service approaches. So those are a few of the things we're gonna do around customer service. Next slide please. And finally, under equity, uh, it was mentioned earlier by Commissioner Rubio that one of the things happening within this franchise agreement is that we're rep recommending uh, the rec requirement of health care for all hauler employees, and we'll, we would reflect that in the administrative rules as well. Uh, we would also continue doing workforce demographic surveys. Uh, we'd want to support the impact and improvement of the Driving Diversity Program, which is a program that haulers have developed to bring uh, job opportunities to more of our community. And um, we want to also involve our smaller haulers in uh, equity and inclusion work. Under resilience, it was mentioned as well that we want to take some steps for, to improve preparedness uh, for disasters. And the way we would reflect that in administrative rules is that here at the bottom of this slide, you see we, would, we propose to establish some standardized continuity of operations plans or guidance for use by the haulers so that everyone has contingency plans in place that help them pivot in the event of a disruption to their service. Next slide, please. All right, we mentioned that uh, we held space within, the, within this process to talk with our haulers about um, our residential system's role in enhanced recycling services that de are delivered through optional subscriptions, such as the services provided today by entities like James Recycling and Ridwell. And this is the recommendation that emerged from that discussion. The recommendation is to basically maintain the status quo exemption that allows those companies to collect solid waste materials for recycling, but to explore policies to add accountability and transparency with some of these exempted collectors, which could include greater oversight of services or materials collected uh, in order to promote more meaningful environmental benefits, or maybe requirements for reporting or transparency. Um, 
and perhaps administrative rules governing their services that are a little bit more consistent with the city's highly regulated residential collection system. And we also recommend that staff explore policies that would ensure an equitable implementation of the Recycling Modernization Act when producers are gonna bring more dollars to the table to support recycling in our community. We wanna make sure that those dollars are put to work in a way that uh, is broadly beneficial to our entire community through the services that our franchised collectors provide. So we could consider requiring that any waste packaging covered under the Recycling Modernization Act uh, may, we may require addressing it through our residential collection system. So that's our recommendation on that topic, which does admittedly lie a little outside the franchise review process, but we had committed to in discussing it within the process, so uh, that, that is that recommendation. Next slide, please. All right, we're wrapping up here. Uh, to close the, our process, we held a 30-day public comment period that ended in, on August 29th. It was noticed per city uh, guidance as well. Uh, it was also promoted on social media. We received seven comments, and they were all similar to comments that were received in the survey that had gone community-wide uh, a couple months before. So in reacting to those public comments, we, we did not re recommend any additional changes to the proposed franchise agreement. Uh, as a result of the public comment. Next slide, please. So that really concludes the bulk of our presentation. Um, here are the next steps, if you so choose. We propose that you adopt the proposed uh, franchise agreement and endorse recommendations in our franchise review report that are along the lines of the recommendations that we just outlined for you this afternoon. Uh, I do want to add my thanks as well to our haulers who spent a lot of time in conversations uh, working through this as well as uh, staff, uh, including uh, Pete Chisholm Winfield and our attorney, Nancy Thorington, and the haulers, Beth, Beth Vargas Duncan and, and Anna Richter Taylor represented the haulers. I want to appreciate them for their investment of time in this work. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Um, thank you for that presentation and thank you for all your work in this uh, field. Um, in your comments, you mentioned that most Portlanders don't realize that you can reach out to your current hauler to pick up bulky items. Uh, how does that work? For the record, for anyone who's watching, if I were a Portlander with an old couch, an old mattress, a broken scooter, just to list some of the things that are lying around my house that need to go out the door, uh, how do I work with my current provider to get them picked up? How it works today is that you'd give them a call or shoot them an email and get a quote for what you've, what you've got and they'll come get it. Uh, and it may vary according to the volume and amount and weight of the stuff you're putting out. All right, great, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. Yeah, so just going back to the gutting principle question, what about a clean city? Like I mean, when we think about, you know, where does that fit in in sort of shaping priorities uh, in this area? I'm sorry, Commissioner, I missed the first part, sorry. Well, where does a cleaner city fit in sort of our, you know, is it just assumed that's one of the things we're targeting? Because we just went through four guarding principles, but a, a clean city wasn't one of them. And I, I, you know, I guess I'm getting to kind of first principles as to what, what we're really trying to achieve with these franchise agreements. Yeah, great question, Commissioner. So. Um, as we kind of alluded to at the beginning, the, the per this particular franchise agreement really only focuses on the service that goes to um, residents that live in um, single family, one to four unit. So in theory, if our haulers are doing a great job picking up those, those bins on a daily basis, uh, there's, they're not generating any litter or waste, or to Commissioner Maps's prior comment, if they're picking up all that bulky waste, they're keeping you know, illegal dumping off the streets. They're keeping litter off the streets because we're picking up those service. There's a whole, uh, you know, series of questions to be answered about how we're providing service to our multifamily residents, um, how we can improve collection services for our businesses, and the broader conversation about illegal dumping and litter that's happening. So absolutely inherent in the franchise agreement is good service results in a cleaner city. It doesn't solve all the problems that our, our, um, that our city's facing when it comes to, to trash, frankly, um, but in this particular area of collections, single family, um, we're doing an exceptional job. Okay, I mean, it, in, I would just submit, may want to be more explicit about that, that, I mean, it, it, and I, sometimes we take for, we just assume what our core purpose is, but uh, residential services in part so that we have a clean city and, uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's a, a recommendation that we're happy to incorporate going forward because you're right, it's, it's inherent to the work. So thank you for that recommendation. 
that's an easy that's an easy one because we're already um, from this particular angle um, doing a great job. A lot of work to be done. That one acknowledge. There's a lot more that we need to do. Good. Right. Anything else on this side? All right. Well, thank you for your time and commitment to this issue. Uh, I am glad to see that the recommendations you're putting forward uh, help improve the efficiency, the cost effectiveness, and the overall effectiveness of our collection service. Yeah. This is a first reading of an on emerge. Do I think we have public comment? Oh, public testimony. Yeah. Sorry. We have a couple people signed yeah, up. Yeah. Sorry about that. Three minutes each. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, first up, we have Hugo Evangelista Corredo. Hugo. Is Hugo online? Uh, uh, they must have dropped out. Um, is Hugo here? No. OK. Uh, next, we have Carrie Walker McCullough. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Hello again. Mayor Wheeler and commissioners, my name is Carrie Walker McCullough. My family has owned and operated Walker Garbage and Recycling, serving the residents of Portland and other outlying areas in our area for 75 years. Today, I'm here on behalf of the Portland Haulers Association, which is comprised of those companies that provide the residential solid waste recycling and composting services to more than 150,000 residents of the city of Portland. Most of our, custom, of our companies are locally owned and Oregon grown. We have a long history and connection to the city of Portland. We recognize that our service is on the behalf of the city and we take that role very seriously. We strive to provide quality service with transparency and accountability to our customers. And I in turn would like to acknowledge the staff of BPS because this process that we followed um, that led to this agreement was collaborative and constructive. We had regular discussions that led to productive problem solving. The agreement reflects outcomes of those discussions, providing a fra framework to continue building on the success of the franchise system while reaffirming our commitment to improve customer service, expand uh, equity and workforce diversity, support our low income residents, meet the city's renewable um, fuel standards, and we wanna lead the transition to Oregon's Plastic Pollution and Recycling Modernization Act. Um, starting with household batteries, that discussion, I'd like to assure you, does have some traction and urgency and the haulers are very willing um, to take that on um, my company uh, we do that in all of our other jurisdictions. We have added household batteries to our curbside um, service. So I hope that you'll adopt the ad agreement so that we continue to proudly represent the city. And with your support today, we move forward and we're looking forward that to that next stage of our partnership in reviewing the administrative rules and policies so that we can continue providing that good, equitable, transparent solid waste recycling and compost service to the residents of Portland. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your being here. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, Commissioner Ryan. I'm just curious, when you said that you offer the battery service to other jurisdictions but not here, what's the difference? Um, those regulators have added, have voted to add household batteries to their curbside program. And so, um, when the city of Portland, when you all decide that that is something that you would like to do, um, we would uh, probably endorse, we would use the same process that we use now to mitigate fire in truckloads because batteries can cause that to happen. Um, Portland, of course, is way larger than my other jurisdictions, so um, it is a bigger process and I, but we do, we are very willing. As an association, we've talked about that. We're really excited to see what other things the curbside review that's being done statewide comes up with for what's going to be on the list from the Recycling Modernization Act. But um, batteries is something that um, 
we have talked about and are willing to get started whenever you guys are ready. Great. I won't have to keep bugging my friends in Beaverton. Yeah, Beaverton and, and, so, and, <laughs> <laughs> and um, unincorporated Washington County. Your buddies there can help you out with that too. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. Thanks for being here. Yes, thank you. Okay. Perhaps um, the let's... staff could let us know what we're waiting for, or when we when we could start to move forward on that. I'm just curious. We do we do have one more testifier. Oh, okay. Um, Hugo Evangelista Thank you, Ms. Hello. Does everyone hear me? Go ahead, Hugo. Okay, I'm going to be honest. I actually just joined in. This is the first time I ever joined in a city council meeting. Uh, and because I am a Portland University student, and I'm just wanting to say, like, just learning about what's been going on with the community and definitely the, with the waste uh, program that's going on that, you, that the city of uh, Portland wants to accept. And I feel like I agree totally with what was being said that, you know, waste is still a huge problem within the community. community and uh, hopefully, hopefully this program gets passed. Great, thank you, Hugo. That completes testimony. Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, it's a, oh, I thought you wanted to ask about batteries. Oh, I, yeah, sure. Come on up, Donnie. I thought that was in motion. Sorry, a lot of moving parts here. Uh, so I just thought we might as well have this conversation. Yeah, no, right? let's yeah. let's let's unpack it. I, I to be to be um, super frank, Commissioner, we absolutely want. Uh, not just batteries, there's other high priority items that we're always evaluating. Um, but um, as alluded to, it's not just about how we collect it, but that's where it goes. The batteries have to end up somewhere. So, Evan, do you want to kind of break down the backside of, of battery collections? Uh, sure. So, K Kerry mentioned, you know, that Portland, uh, as a uh, as a larger community, you know, it, some things just take a little bit longer to line up. We, ha we are served by several material recovery facilities, which we call MRFs. That's where our recycling ends up. And we will be able to collect batteries once we've confirmed that we have enough of those facilities that are willing to accept them. So we're pushing for <laughs> electrification, yet we still don't have anywhere to take them in an easy way. Well, there are a couple of MRFs that serve the other communities in our region that are accepting the batteries, so we would be able to rely on those, but we want to make sure that the other material recovery facilities that serve us with recycling yeah. will be able to take them so that we have sufficient capacity. I hear what you're saying. I'm just, yeah. It's the infrastructure that we have to keep building why we keep Correct. moving towards electrification. Yeah. Yes, sir. And we need to keep having this honest, open dialogue about that. Absolutely. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Good. Anything else? All right, this is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you. We're in recess till 3 p.m.
discussion. The next item is item 864, a report time certain 3 p.m. Except 2022 through 2023 Safe Rest Villages annual report. Colleagues, welcome back. Three years ago, Commissioner Ryan identified that there was a gap in homeless shelter options related to people living unsheltered on the street. He rightly noted that we were seeing an increase of people who are living chronically homeless, many of whom had severe behavioral health issues. This population was very challenging to provide services to, as many were reluctant to go into traditional congregate shelters. As such, he launched the Safe Rest Village program. There was a lot of skepticism about the program, how it would work, how much it would cost, if people would even want to go there. However, Commissioner Ryan kept moving the program forward, and it has proven successful with waiting lists at many sites and constant requests to refer people into the program. The seven safe rest villages that exist today, in addition to the temporary alternative shelter sites, fill a critical service gap that provides low barrier alternative shelters as well as support services to help stabilize unsheltered Portlanders and get them ready for their next step on the continuum. I want to acknowledge that Commissioner Ryan took a beating in the early stages of this program and it has been validated. I didn't want him to have to say that. I wanted to embarrass him myself by saying that up front. And with that, I will turn it over to Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. That was very kind. Colleagues, well, I am so pleased to share this progress report with you today. This report includes seven sites, which is one more site than the Promise Six. These sites provide services, stability, build resilience, and help people get into housing. It took the collaboration among many to make this happen and allow me to give some additional context. It was in the winter of 2021, our office started the Streets to Stability Task Force to tear down the silos internally at the city so we could represent with a more collective voice with the county. In the spring of 2021, in collaboration with Commissioner Rubio, we passed shelter to housing codes to even make this tiny homes alternative shelters possible in our community. This open policy conversation of how we could, as a city, leverage the new ARPA money and respond to this humanitarian crisis on our streets. As such, after months of collaboration, all five members of the City Council, with the support of the Multnomah County Chair, passed legislation at the end of 2021. So it's actually only been over, a little over two years, but it does seem longer. And the journey to build the villages began. This project required a robust community engagement for more than two years. I personally did 54 outreach touches ranging from outdoor venues and Zoom meetings with, during the pandemic. I will forever be a little triggered every time I see a chat box. The, new, the news interviews, sit downs at City Hall and in people's living rooms. Sometimes I spoke with four people, other times hundreds. In total, the Safe Rest Village team did 174 community engagement touches, including stakeholder meetings, community advisory committee meetings, and mailers. And this is not counting the numerous daily emails and phone calls. I'd like to acknowledge those joining us in the chamber today. You will hear from many of them, program participants, the good people who staff our seven sites, and our city, county, and community partners who have helped make this program a success. And now I'd like to introduce Charity Montez, the director of the Safe Rest Villages program and the 2022 recipient of the Betsy Ames Leadership Award for her work on this project. She will share about her team's work and accomplishments. Come on up, Charity, take it away. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Didn't expect that part. Um, good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, my name is Charity Montez. I use she, they pronouns, and I have served as the Houselessness Strategies Manager with the Safe Rest Village Program for the last two years, a little bit longer. 
Um, oh yeah, thank you. Um, I do have a PowerPoint. I am delighted to be here today to share the Safe Rest Village Annual Report with you, um, which I hope you all have a printed copy of. Um, we've also posted it online. Today I'm joined in council chambers by the city Safe Rest Village team, shelter staff, and shelter participants. I will share data about our program, including who we've served in the last year, an overview of program finances, and the outcomes of council's investment. You'll hear from our shelter providers and from some of our neighbor and community partners. I'll end the presentation with a short video uh, featuring shelter participants and staff, um, and then there'll be time at the end to answer any questions the council may have. Next slide, please. Thank you. This slide shows the current map of our seven Safe Rest Villages and their geographic distribution across the city. Safe Rest Villages are temporary outdoor shelters ranging in size from 28 to 60 sleeping units, providing a safe and secure place for people to rest. All Safe Rest Villages provide basic amenities including meals, hygiene, and laundry facilities, as well as the supportive services needed for someone to transition from the streets to housing, including case management, peer support, housing and employment navigation, and more. As Commissioner Ryan said, we currently have seven sites, and that's including the city's first RV safe park, providing 326 sleeping units. Some of these units serve couples, which allows the Safe Rest Village program to serve up to 400 people on any given night. As you'll read in this annual report, some of these shelters were under construction last year, so the programmatic data that we're sharing is for the five shelters that were operating during fiscal year 22-23. Next slide, please. From July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2023, of the five Safe Rest Villages that were open, some were open for the full year, while some were only open for a few months. During that time, we provided 43,475 nights of safe sleep in 211 sleeping units. We served 345 people and had 143 exits from shelter. Of those exits, 70 people moved into housing. The mean length of stay for people who exited a safe rest village was 158 days, which is just under six months. We know that not having legal documents is one of the biggest barriers to accessing housing, employment, and reliable health care services. Uh, these documents needed uh, include a state ID, birth certificate, social security cards, and they can be difficult to obtain without an address to mail them to or with the resources to pay for them. So we're happy to report that our shelter providers supported participants in obtaining 169 of these critical documents last year, removing barriers for shelter participants to access things like housing and employment. Next slide, please. We also know that various populations are disproportionately impacted by houselessness, including black, indigenous, and people of color communities, as well as LGBTQIA folks and people living with a disability. Digging deeper into the specific demographics of people uh, served at the Safe Rest Village's last fiscal year, we find that 33% of participants identified as chronically homeless. HUD's definition of chronically homeless is extensive, um, but in the simplest terms, it means a person living with a disability in a place not meant for human habitation for the last 12 months or for 12 months total over the last three years. Some of our shelter participants report living on the street for 10, 11, even 20 years before entering a safe rest village. 58% of participants identified as male, 28% identified as female, 8% identified as a gender other than male or female, and 6% identified as transgender. 57% of Safe Rest Village shelter participants last year identified as having one or more disability, and 57% of participants identified as non-white or multiracial. As a reference point, the most recent census identified about 26% non-white or multiracial people in, in Portland, compared to about 22% in Multnomah County, and in the 2022 point in time count, about 38% of unsheltered people in Multnomah County identified as non-white or multiracial. So while we do see racial disparities in the folks that are living unsheltered, 
we are meeting our goal of serving people of color in the safe rest villages at or higher than the rate they experience unsheltered houselessness in our region. All of these numbers, of course, are very high level um, for the program as a whole, for all of our sites. We go into much more detail, including shelter-specific numbers on our Safe Rest Village uh, data dashboard, uh, which is online as part of the ARPA dashboard, and it's updated quarterly. Next slide, please. The Safe Rest Village program was originally conceived of as a three-year pilot program and is primarily funded through American Rescue Plan Act dollars, also known as ARPA. The Safe Rest Village program represents the city's largest ARPA investment with an allocation of $52.3 million. These ARPA funds run through December 2024. The program was also allocated $3 million in general funds and $1 million in a state grant bringing the total funding for the Safe Rest Village program over the three years to $56.3 million. Next slide, please. Shifting to expenses, the Safe Rest Village program spent $19.9 million in fiscal year 22-23. This slide shows those expenses across each of our shelter sites. This includes all acquisition and construction costs, shelter operations, including shelter staffing 24 seven, as well as the services and meals for shelter participants and regular site maintenance and ongoing expenses like utilities. Expenses at each site vary for a couple of reasons. Uh, some of these sites were built in the previous fiscal year, so the numbers only represent the ongoing shelter operations. That's the case for BIPOC Village, Queer Affinity Village, and the Multnomah Safe Rest Village. The four other sites were under construction or were only open part of the year. For example, uh, Peninsula Crossing Safe Rest Village was our largest expense last year at $4.2 million. It is also one of our largest sites with 60 shelter units and the capacity to serve 70 people any given night. The expenses at Peninsula include all of the acquisition of the shelter units and the services structures um, at the site as well as the site development, the construction, um, and a couple of months of shelter operations. Next slide, please. And speaking of shelter operations, so that you don't have to get your calculators out, one of the questions that we are, um, get asked often is how much does it cost to run a Safe Rest Village for one year? So this slide is a snapshot of shelter operations for a 12-month period at each site. This does not include any of the one-time cost of acquisition or construction, but does include um, the cost of our shelter provider contracts and ongoing utilities and site maintenance. In general, um, expenses range from two point range from two point one million dollars for a twenty eight unit shelter like Multnomah Safe Rest Village, that's the smallest one we have, to three million dollars for a sixty unit shelter like Peninsula Crossing Safe Rest Village. The cost of shelter operations for all seven Safe Rest Villages for one year, if they were all open for the same twelve months, <coughs> is about nineteen point six million dollars, and including city and county staff and program costs which only account for about 6% of that total. So with 326 shelter units, the cost per unit per year would be about $60,000. However, as some of these units can serve couples, full capacity of 400 people on a given night would bring that total down to $49,000 per space per year. And when we take shelter exits into consideration, the price per person per year can be even less. Our goal is that people transition out of the Safe Rest Villages in three to nine months. Next slide, please. Finally, oh wait, oh wait, yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to recap some of the outcomes of Council's investment in the Safe Rest Village program. Of the 143 people who exited a Safe Rest Village last year, 70 people, almost half, went to temporary or permanent housing. Of those 70 people, 61 people, or 87%, went to permanent destinations, which includes renting an apartment on their own or with subsidies. I am a person with lived experience of houselessness, and last year, my aunt died on the streets in Eugene 
the very same day that we opened the Menlo Park Safe Rest Village in East Portland. So it's from that experience in that place uh, that I say, I believe the Safe Rest Villages are realizing these early successes because of what the program does differently. Safe Rest Villages offer the privacy of a locking door, a place to store personal possessions, and partners and pets are welcome. Additionally, Safe Rest Villages are service-rich outdoor shelters, offering case management, housing navigation, support from staff who have lived experience, daily meals, access to hygiene services, and mental and behavioral health supports. In essence, Safe Rest Villages meet people where they are, provide dignity and stability, and help to build resilience, all with the end goal of helping folks move into housing. Our annual Safe Rest Village report includes quotes from people living and working in the villages, as well as personal stories of success that highlight how the villages are improving and saving lives. But instead of hearing more from me about why this model works, I would like to invite up our wonderful shelter providers to talk about the great work they've been doing. Um, let's see, Council Clerk, you could pause the slideshow and then, um, and then Andy, Caleb, Major Bob, and Jeff, I will move out of the way for you. Thanks, Cherry. Welcome, welcome. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit. For the record, my name is Andy Goebel, and I am the Executive Director of All Good Northwest. We are proud to serve as the program operators for three of the Safe Rest Village programs, including BIPOC Village, QA Village, or Queer Affinity Village, and Multnomah Safe Rest Village. I want to thank you for the opportunity to partner with the city in doing this incredibly important work. And I'm proud to report that since the beginning of our time doing this work, we have served uh, over 325 individuals at these three sites and been responsible for housing 75 individuals out of these three safe rest villages. That said, I was just at Multnomah Safe Rest Village this after, earlier this afternoon and happened to be in a conversation with our navigation specialist there, who, by the way, used to be a participant in the village program and is now working to house participants in the program. And she was happy to say, Andy, we have two additional folks being housed this week and uh, another one who will be housing next week. When I tend to show up, when I show up on sites, this tends to be the most exciting report that I get is the uh, housing of individuals out of these sites. That said, I'm even more excited that in the future we are working to establish a retention program because as most of you probably know, we can get folks housed, but oftentimes without the supportive services, we'll see those folks back out on the streets. And our goal, our mission, is to unlock a sustainable sense of home for participants. So we're excited to continue to partner with the city in doing that retention work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Loesha Mao. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I have joined Cultivate Initiative's team in the last few months and am excited to be a part of the success of this project and of the Safe Rest Villages collectively. Uh, our success is, you can see our success at the Menlo Park SRV in tangible things like our housing placements. Uh, we've had 17 successful housing placements in the nine, nine and a half months that we have been operating. Um, we also have two housing placements for this week uh, that we're pending this week and another for the following week. It's exciting to see the opportunity of our neighbors to feel seen, to have access to resources, to be able to navigate the space. And some of the less tangible, some of the results that we are able to see that are a little bit harder to, to see in our data points, um, the safety and stability and dignity that's present within our villagers, the opportunity to build community and to be represented in that community. Uh, some of the struggles that we have encountered through the process have also been wrapped around engagement and how are we supporting people in accessing these services that are plentiful in our space. Uh, and, and one of the opportunities that we've taken to, to be able to engage in a way that isn't punitive, um, we often have the conversation around shelter stays and wanting folks to transition quickly and also not wanting it to be punitive in the sense that 
how can we get you to engage without making it seem as if the lack of engagement means we need you right back on the streets. We need you to be a part of this. And so one of the systems that we've leaned into is um, engagement punch cards. So we've got a few punch cards here today. And if anyone finds themselves wanting to stop by the Menlo Park SRV, we'd love to have you. We'd love to have you participate in an activity with us, see what engagement looks like. Um, for us, this has been an opportunity to say, meet with your case manager, meet with the peer support specialist, set a goal with one of those individuals. Completing that goal will get you two punches. Setting the goal in the first place is gonna get you one. And engaging with our activities, going and accessing services, mental health services with our community partners that are located around. Um, connecting with our nursing teams that are coming on site. All of these are opportunities to encourage engagement as well as recognizing, as Andy shared, housing stability means engaging with retention services and becoming a part of the community. So when they are exiting our programs, there's a sense of stability and awareness of external resources. And so we also use this as an opportunity to say, did you go and connect with the community partner? Did you go in and recognize a resource externally? Um, so we are, we are looking to continue to build community to encourage our neighbors to be a part of the community that they're surrounding um, and to, to find healthy ways and be a part of the, the Safe Rest Village system that can, that can just support more access to these opportunities. So thank you. Mayor Wheeler, commissioners, thank you so much for having us today. Uh, my name is Major Bob Lloyd. I'm the Salvation Army's Metro Social Services Coordinator. And I would like to express my appreciation on behalf of our Salvation Army Sunderland team for the privilege of partnering with the City of Portland and JOHS to provide Portland's first safe place for many of our mobile residents to park their trailers and be able to sleep soundly for the first time in many years and often, often most cases. We've been open for barely 90 days. And although we have a capacity of 55 RV slots, as of today, we have 44 RVs in place with 75 neighbors. And as we increase our parking capacity for participant vehicles, we will be increasing the number of RV units and expect to be at capacity soon. Thanks to the Sunderland RV Safe Park, about 75 souls are now able to sleep at night without worrying about middle of the night intrusions. And many participants are able to return to work each day, confident that during their absence, their RV unit will not be stolen or destroyed. Community members no longer have to worry about their RV sanitation system since they now have access to bathroom showers and laundry facilities. And they no longer need to worry about keeping food in a safe manner as our loaf truck delivers a hot meal every day to their, to their units. I want to mention specifically Frank and Joanne who lost their housing when Frank suffered a stroke and medical bills cost them their home and left them feeling fortunate to be living in a trailer which became an unsafe environment along 33rd Avenue. Now Joanne is able to drive to her job every day while Frank sits close by waiting for her shift to end and they don't have to worry about the safety of their trailer and their belongings which includes all of their identification paperwork, medications and so forth. They as well as over 70 others rest soundly now because of this program and can now start to think about their future and we're privileged to be a, a part of this team. Thank you very much. Mayor, Commissioners, thank you for uh, inviting us today. For the record, my name is Jeff Dickey. Um, I serve as Director of Operations for Urban Alchemy. Um, I was asked to kind of talk about our business model. We have a, a, a different approach to uh, staffing than other organizations. Our approach to solve social issues revolving around marginalized groups has been unique. We developed a staffing model that meets the needs of our residents and actually will help them heal from the trauma they've experienced while homeless. While homeless. In our experience, growing from a non, small nonprofit company in San Francisco to a growing national organization has allowed us to test our approach, which has proved to be very successful. There is no exception for Peninsula Crossing and Reedway Safe Villages, of which we are now managing. We have about, 100 and, about 132 residents at this time in those villages. Our staffing target aims at a couple groups. First, we hire long-term offenders who have made the choice to turn their lives around and apply principles of restorative justice, which has been the backbone of our success. These individuals have made enormous strides in changing the social scapes of urban, urban environments. This may sound funny, but we've added morality and accountability with, where there was none or very little before in a caring way, not through force, but through the love for the people we're interacting with knowing that causing trauma causes people and causing trauma keeps people in endless cycles of despair. We also aim for those with lived experience, those who, who have been through the trauma and found resiliency. We hire those that have been, lived on the streets and who have been homeless. We, um, one of our residents living at Peninsula Crossing is also employed with us working at Reedway. 
She has made great strides in her own life as well as helped many others living in similar situations. In this way, our workforce is able to relate to those still in the struggle and offer the kind of understanding and support no one else can provide. At Peninsula Crossing and Reed Rice Safe Villages, we are using these relationships to help our guests return to a life of normalcy by recovering from their trauma and moving into stable housing situations. I've also um, wanted to add one last thing that um, uh, Portland Police Bureau has reported that around the Peninsula Crossing Safe Rest Village, um, they have um, fewer calls and, and less, less instances of crime in that area. Thank you for this time. Thank you. Um, at this time, I wanted to invite up uh, some of our neighbors of the Queer Affinity Village, uh, Bevan and Bodo. Welcome. Hi, my name is Bodo Heiliger. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the head of school at the International School of Portland. I'm here with Bevan Burns, uh, the head of school at uh, Bridges Middle School. Our two schools of approximately 600 students from ages 3 through 13 proudly sit 50 feet from the site of the Queer Affinity Village in the heart of downtown Portland. We appreciate the Queer Affinity Village and its place in Portland. Our schools believe in Portland, and we believe in the village model. We've been vocal advocates for the participants and partnered with All Good Northwest to educate our students about houselessness. It is our mission to break down stereotypes and empower students to take action to make the world a better and more peaceful place. From supply drives to food drop-offs to paint donations for its murals, we welcome the Queer Affinity Village and its participants. We are proud of its place in our community. And we also value the relationships we formed over the past two years many of whom are in this very chamber today. Despite a rocky start, Commissioner Ryan's office, especially Kelly Torres, stepped up to listen to the community and solve challenges. We appreciate Mayor, Mayor Wheeler's creation of the Street Services Coordination Center to support unhoused individuals and ensure the safety and security of village participants and our young students. And we look forward to finally engaging with the county so all stakeholders can fully collaborate and execute on our good neighbor agreement. We really thank you for this opportunity. Hi. <clears throat> for the record, my name is Bevan Burns. I use she, her pronouns. I am a mother to four and a Portland native with deep roots in the LGBTQAI um, community. And I am personally really proud to support the Queer Affinity Village at Native Parkway. For the past 12 years, I have served as the executive director at Bridges Middle School. We're a private um, nonprofit school right here in downtown and the only school in Oregon, only middle school in Oregon exclusively serving students with learning disabilities. Many of which have actually been here to testify before you, Mayor Wheeler, you may remember in Absolutely. clean air issues. Yeah. The staff, students, and parents at Bridges and the International School of Portland really believe that global citizenship starts with taking action in our community right here and right now. And as such, we have and continue to wholeheartedly support the mission and vision of Safe Rest Villages. And we believe that they are an important pillar of the complex infrastructure supporting Portland's most vulnerable citizens. We are grateful for the supportive partnerships that have developed with the arrival of our friends at the Queer Affinity Village that is located right between our two schools. <clears throat> These partnerships include not only the program participants, which are wonderful, and the dedicated Safe Rest Village staff, which we have grown to work really collaboratively with, but also extend throughout the neighborhood and the city. We support the SRV model because we believe in its successful approach to supporting people holistically with dignity and love. These are values that I share with the city of Portland, the city I still feel so proud to call home. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Next, I'd like to invite a representative from the Friends of Multnomah Safe Rest Village. Ruth? Welcome. 
Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Ruth Adkins. I'm here as a Multnomah Village neighbor and representing friends of Multnomah Safe Rest Village. Um, we're an informal group of volunteers that came together wanting to find ways to support and help the success of the SRV in our neighborhood. Um, we were inspired by a group called St. John's Welcomes the Village, and with their permission, we borrowed a lot of their ideas, created a very simple website, fmsrv.org, a Facebook group, which now has 392 members, and um, went from there. We have an ongoing lawn sign campaign as well. So one of our leaders, Robin Schaffler, wasn't able to be here today because she wanted to honor her commitment to a volunteer shift inside the SRV uh, with Street Books, one of the amazing organizations working there. But we would be happy to work with any other neighbors who want to learn from our experience. So our activities have included things similar to what you heard just from the other partners, <coughs> food drives, uh, we did a holiday cookie drive, we brought bedding. Um, solicited donations from local businesses, and Robin did amazing work for pet care, uh, working with local veterinarians and animal aid. But what we've really done is just simple acts of kindness with some community organizing. Uh, it's nothing compared to the day-to-day -day work that the amazing folks at All Good do and the participants, but we're honored to do our small part. There's a lot of anger out there, including in our neighborhood, but there's a lot of love, too as evidenced by the outpouring of support for the SRV. I feel hope when I see the results in this report, and I feel hope when we come together as a community to do what we can to address this humanitarian crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, finally, I'd like to end the presentation with a short video uh, so you can hear from shelter staff and participants in their own words. Council Clerk, do you have? You do. Thank you. Never works perfectly the first time. Mm -hmm. it it's a different world out there. You know, the homeless world is cold. I'm privy to how that lifestyle is, how alone it is. People die. This is a serious crisis that we're having. My name is Sonia Lee Sebastian. People don't realize how much multitasking that has to really be done. You're trying to provide a, a roof over your head and where you're going to eat, where you're going to pee, and, and if, uh, if your stuff's going to be stolen and how you, you hide, you have to go hide your things and if you have to, you know, and you don't sleep. The few times I slept, I, I got everything stolen. So then, then you have nothing, then you really have nothing. Our safe. Fresh Village aims to provide emotional and physical safety. That's important. A, a lot of them don't have organ IDs. A lot of them don't know where the where the welfare office is. A lot of them don't know what a food stamp car looks like. Yeah, the main goal is to uh, to bring people in and get them stable from mental health issues, drug and alcohol addiction, behavioral issues, and we help people with you know budgeting. It's all about you know getting people ready to be from the streets to be housed. It's one of the reasons why a lot of people don't go to the shelters in different places because they can't have their pets. This is uh, Jesse uh, Sebastian. Um, he is my federally uh, registered service dog. For me, I'm not going anywhere. My dog's not going.
I wish people could see the expressions on people's face when they get awkward at a place here. Um, you know, I wish they could see the the, the emotions and tears of uh, being in a place that they they feel loved right right when they come in here. They have a restroom. They get, they can bathe every day. They have a safe place to sleep that's comfortable. They got air conditioning. They got heaters in their their, their space. You can do your laundry when you want to. Laundry is personal. A lot of people sometimes don't have a lot. They have the clothes that they wear over and over again. So when we had a washer dryer here, we were like, wow. I like this whole idea of this because it's like it's a step between homelessness and housing. So a lot of people think it's just put them into a place and, you know, get them a job and they'll be fine. And it's like, no, it's not that simple. Why this is effective is it's just enough shelter and then it's outside. So you're figuring that homeless people are out on the street for years. You can't put them in a high rise. That's too much of a adjustment. Like this is perfect. We put them first with everything we do. It makes me feel a part of something positive. That's cool. It's amazing to see, uh, since I've been here a month, um, the transformations in the, their personality, everybody's personality, everybody's um, coming together. It, it is a sense of community. I felt um, relieved when I, when I first woke up here. Yeah, relieved and safe. Thank you, commissioners and mayor. That ends our formal presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Very good. Colleagues, any questions? Keelan, do we have public testimony? No one signed up. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I have a quick question or two. Um, first, I want to thank everyone for who testified today and, and who supports this program. Uh, and it, and uh, I very much want to recognize the leadership of Commissioner Ryan and, of course, the mayor. Um, and I think several of the presentations that we heard today, um, uh, uh, peer support specialist and retention services were referenced. Can you just give us a sense of how that worked? Um, is done and who does it and what, what are those services like? I actually think that that question would be best answered by one of our shelter providers. Sure, can, can, can I get a volunteer to come up? You don't have to send everybody up. I, just one case study to, um, I think, educate the public would be awesome. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity to share. So when it comes to peer support services, what's really valuable is these are folks with lived experience. A sure. lot of them have the certification. And whereas uh, it's a different kind of staff, and they, they don't have the same expectations of case management, the same kind of reporting expectations. So there can be, to, to, for lack of a better word right now, a level of intimacy and conversation and a level of trust that's built. When it comes to retention services, uh, I'm going to be honest and tell you right now that unfortunately that's a little spotty. Um, it, we, we've just now, thankfully with a partnership with uh, Joint Office, been able to build a, a, our first mobile support team. And eventually what that looks like is either the organization that's been doing the sheltering work and the support work continues to get the opportunity to do that work once we house folks. or. Another avenue which we're exploring is actually developing and building permanent supportive housing so our organization can provide that support, I like to say, from the streets to when people get their keys and then beyond. So they continue to maintain that relationship and have the support so that they can stay in housing. Uh, thank you, that's, um, that, that's very helpful. And I think one of the things I'm trying to de dial in on with this line of questioning is uh, what role, if any, does the county play in supporting the work that, that you do? Um, is, are you kind of out there on your own? You just referenced the county, so it sounds like they're there a little bit. Yeah. But. So I'm, what I'm thankful for is it's a continuing conversation with the county. Originally, our, our first contract was just for shelter services, and that includes housing navigation services. But our organization in particular is deeply committed to sustainable housing. We believe fully in the housing first model, but so often uh, we can get folks housed, but if we don't continue to provide that 
support. Again, as I said before, the recidivism rate is, is way too high. And I'm thankful now that we were able to uh, just now add to our contract to this mobile support service, and we continue to want to grow that. We also are seeking with the county to develop permanent supportive housing sites, and ultimately the, the partnership and oversight that the county provides in, in that work that is new for, for us as an organization, but we find absolutely essential is that partnership is key. Uh, great, thank you very much. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, colleagues. Anything else? If not, I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So so moved. So moved. moved. Commissioner uh, Maps moves. Commissioner Ryan seconds the report. Any further discussion on the report? Seeing none, please call the roll. Maps. Um, again, I want to thank Commissioner Ryan and the mayor for their leadership in this space. I want to thank all, each and every one of you um, who works on the Safe Rest Village projects. I've met many of you out on field trips. It's great to see you here today. And um, also very much appreciated the testimony that we heard from folks uh, in the community. Um, I vote aye. Rubio. I want to thank uh, the mayor and Commissioner Ryan for bringing this uh, item forward to council. And I especially want to recognize the leadership and vision and heart that Commissioner Ryan has brought into these projects and his approach of not only providing services, but creating a sense of community in the villages. Um, and I also want to appreciate Charity. Um, you and your team have performed with tremendous professionalism, uh, determination, and a lot of grace. And I know it hasn't been easy, uh, but it's paid off tremendously. And so I just want to congratulate you on this important milestone. Um, I also want to thank all the other staff and providers, um, volunteers, and community members who've been engaged um, with these villages who time and again keep showing up to serve our under unhoused neighbors. Um, this is a, an important and courageous project, and I'm hopeful for the day that we'll see close to 100% exit rate into permanent housing and excited to see where we are next year. I vote aye. Ryan. Yes, um, I want to start off by acknowledging that I saw Dan Field, <clears throat> the head of uh, the Joint Office for Homelessness. There he is behind a camera man. Anyway, good to see you. I'm not going to have you come up and talk. I thought about it, but I wanted to make sure that people knew that you were here. That means a lot to us at the city. After pushback from the county and the homelessness industry, I'm glad to see this proof of concept is providing a path for chronic homelessness to permanent housing. This proof of concept has led to the county's investment in the new task sites, which will grow more capacity to address the homelessness crisis Portland is facing. I want to call to attention funding for this program is pri primarily from one-time ARPA dollars, that's the American Rescue Act dollars. The county and the city need to work together to ensure we have a sustainable funding model to keep these operable and serving our homeless community. You can be sure I will be championing this as we move forward with the support of all my colleagues. I'd like to recognize the tireless and off and thankless work performed by the Safe Rest Village team. I'm going to have you stand up. Please stand up as I recognize you. Homelessness Strategies Manager, Charity Montez. Thanks, Charity. Stay up, please. Asset Construction Project Manager, I see you, Michelle. Michelle Ladd. Program Coordinator, Jake Dornblazer. Here you are, Jake. Community Engagement Coordinator, Lottie Porter. Lottie and communications liaison, Brian Aptekar, who's um, on a much deserved vacation, and grants, um, where's our grants person, Mike Johnson? Not here? Okay. Anyway, I want us to pause right now. I'd like all of you to give them a big round of applause. Thank you very much. These folks were the original hires for this program over two years ago. You don't have to stay standing up if you don't want. Thanks. <laughs> it's been a long uphill journey with many who questioned and pushed back this version, this vision. But your dedication and your call to action have made this program a model for the region. Thank you so much. And Charity Montez, you were a senior policy advisor in my office staying very focused on BDS and then housing, when we decided it was time for action to address this crisis. We knew what we wanted to do, but we didn't exactly know who, 
would, how or who would lead this or how to do it. There was no playbook for this work. And then you stepped up and said in the middle of those many conversations, do you want me to run this program, Commissioner? <laughs> Boy, you made my day. I said yes, and just like that, you built a team, you trudged through the mountains of red tape, ARPA does have a lot of red tape, including internal headwinds, as the villages were called names that we don't need to repeat, and the Joint Office of Homeless Services. Um, there, were just, there was tension everywhere as we were trying to build these. There were permitting hurdles. Fortunately, your experience with BDS really helped mitigate a lot of that. There were community concerns, which all make sense, and we, we kept engaging in those tough conversations. And there was even pushback by some elected officials and more. The headwinds were swift. Through it all, you pers persevered. You promised me that you would get every one of these villages built before you returned to your passion, the arts. Today is your last day leading the Safe Rest Village team. And the city is fortunate because you are going to work with the city arts program starting tomorrow. Doesn't she deserve that promotion? Give her another round <laughs> <planet> of applause. <laughs> Charity, I can't thank you enough. Please. And from the bottom of my heart, with your thoughtful and compassionate leadership, and there's Kelly, who's now bringing flowers to Charity. And I just want to say thank you once again. I accept this report. Thanks. Thank you. Someone go next. I think it's me, but. Oh. <laughs> 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 All right, I was caught up in the moment. Gonzalez. That never happened. <laughs> Literally, this is the first time in seven years I've seen that happen. <laughs> it's such a touching subject. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Safe Rest Village team, uh, the service providers, including Urban Alchemy, Salvation Army, Here Together, All Good Northwest, Cultivate Initiatives, and Commissioner Ryan's team for their work. I know this was a leap of faith. Uh, there were times where many in the industry questioned whether this model would work. So I'm so appreciative that you've elected to partner with the city on, the, on this important, what I would call experiment to begin with, uh, certainly evolving to a proof of concept and, and hopefully a path forward for, the, for our community. Um, it's worth emphasizing that the Safe Rest Village is an evolving model. The city is learning from the experiences, what's working for neighborhoods, what's working for residents, how do we connect people in the next step in their uh, pathway. Uh, so I'm not sure we have all the answers yet, but it's continuing to improve, and I think that, that, that that's a good thing. Um, do also want to acknowledge to many residents who have strong feelings about Safe Rest Villages in their neighborhood, um, I'm so appreciative of those communities that have welcomed them with open arms, also fully recognize the uh, legitimate concerns uh, uh, that neighborhoods can have about uh, a disruption of land use planning in their neighborhoods, of welcoming new folks into their neighborhoods, which had sometimes have histories of mental illness, addiction, and, and other issues underlying uh, why they are where they are. Um, and this is going to be an ongoing work in progress as a community. Uh, so I, I don't want to dismiss the legitimate concerns of folks uh, raise about these being placed in their neighborhoods. Um, we just ask that you, you give us a, an opportunity to prove that we can do it as a city and, uh, and that that dialogue never ends. Um, you know, this may be part of the path forward for our community. The city of Portland leads uh, that we experiment, that we test a concept but we cannot do it alone. Uh, financially, we don't have the resources to stand this up in an uh, ongoing basis on our own. Uh, we are not the social services provider in the community. Uh, so I just would want to fully recognize that we have stepped in here in a big way, um, but uh, we will not be able to continue it on our own. Um, at a values level, Portland's going to have to find a way to balance the basic needs of those on our streets, those in unsanctioned camps, uh, and legitimate concerns about livability and public safety and uh, sense of space and cleanliness. And these are the difficult public policy balancing acts that we have to do as electeds. And again, I just want to fully recognize that that, that work continues. That's going to be an everyday thing for us as a community. 
I also want to call out uh, especially uh, Commissioner Ryan and the mayor for their leadership on this. They have taken so many political hits from both sides of the spectrum on this. Um, the, y you really couldn't please anybody initially out of the gate on these concepts. Uh, and you held the path, and you pushed forward, and you learned from it. And to me, that's good public policy. Uh, it may not show up in the polls, but the city is uh, uh, it, 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 the, the city is a better place for your leadership on these really hard topics. Uh, Charity, Jake, and your entire team, just keep it going. Uh, you know, you've inspired here, um, and just keep plowing away. Uh, I'm just going to leave you one last piece. Um, Jake and Charity recently welcomed me to the Reedway uh, Safe for Us Village. And as your Commissioner of Public Safety, I get to see firsthand sometimes the really negative impacts of unsanctioned camping, the impacts it has on our first responder system, um, the impacts of you know, open air drug use, untreated mental illness, unsanctioned camping, and its impact on our neighborhoods and our environment. And so those are dark and difficult topics, and um, the, there's no nothing easy about them. But then I went to, you know, the Reedway Safe Rest Village, and I had hope. That, I, I, that, that, that was the real word walking out for all of the difficulties our community is seeing. I saw a calm place where people were taking steps to rebuild their lives, and the city was serving a role in helping them on that path. And it, it was... It was beautiful because it inspired hope on a day when I got to see all the darkness that's out there too in the city of Portland. So again, thank you to the team. Uh, thank you for the leadership, Commissioner Ryan and the mayor on this. I vote to accept this report and look forward eagerly to see what's next in this program. Wheeler. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to end where I started, which is I, I want to thank Commissioner Ryan and I want to thank Charity and the entire team for your perseverance. In a more politicized environment, people would have quit. They would have given up. Uh, and you didn't. And uh, the results validate the difficulty that you encountered getting to this point. And I agree with Commissioner Gonzalez. I think there is some innovation and creativity here that, that will serve us broadly as we seek to find ways to address the changing circumstances on our streets. I want to acknowledge all of the people who work and volunteer at the Safe Rest Village sites. And I do want to thank the neighbors, those who have come to support the Safe Rest Villages and those who are skeptical about the Safe Rest Villages. We want to thank you for allowing us to do this in your community because it's for the betterment of the entirety of the community. And the good news is it's working. That's the good news here, that, that we're demonstrating a path for people who want to get off and stay off the streets. We're demonstrating a path to be able to do that. I also just want to get to the brass tacks that Commissioner Ryan mentioned. Uh, all of these new arrangements that we are creating at the city of Portland are funded with one-time only money. And they are funded with general fund money. Those are the pots of money we use for public safety, police, fire, 911 emergency response, and emergency management. And we as a council have decided that this is a high enough priority, the homeless crisis that we see on our streets, that we are willing to commit dollars to this type of innovation. But I agree with Commissioner Ryan that we cannot sustain this indefinitely with one time only excess funds. We can't do that. And so uh, we do need the support and help of the county and the state. Uh, and we need access to other funds that exist, whether it's Medicaid reimbursements, whether it's SHS funding, we as a community have to support this model and the other models and innovations that the city of Portland is engaged in. Last but not least, I just want to put a plug in for government at a time when people hate government. It's palpable. I know it. I see it. I even know why. But this should serve as one of several examples of where we are literally reinventing what we do and reprioritizing what we do to respond to changing circumstances in our community, and we're being successful. 
And so I hope people keep that in mind as they see the work that we are trying to do. Charity, uh, I only have one uh, comment, one criticism. Traditionally, one takes a few weeks off before one <laughs> leaves one job and starts into the next. You didn't get the memo, but at least you got the flowers. Well deserved. Thank you. I vote aye, and the report is accepted. Thank you. Thank you. Should we take a brief break? Are you guys okay just to, to plow into the budget? Why, why don't we take a five minute recess just to, to reset here? We will reconvene at, uh, at five after four, please. We're in recess.
in session now that I've got my various cameras working. Keelan, could you please read 865 and on emergency ordinance? Adopt the FY 2023-24 fall supplemental budget and make other budget related changes. Colleagues, first of all, thanks for hanging in there. We've had a, a long day of council. This is a second reading of the fall supplemental budget. Last week, City Budget Director Tim Grew walked us through the fall supplemental budget, as well as an ordinance to update the fund's state of purpose for the Recreational Cannabis Tax Fund. We proposed and seconded three amendments for consideration and took public testimony on those amendments, but we did not vote on them. Today, we will vote on last week's amendments and then open the floor for any potential new amendments. If there are new amendments, we will move and second those. We will take testimony specifically on those amendments, and then we will vote on those amendments as well. At that time, I will assess the council's support for adding an emergency clause, and we'll prece proceed with a vote on the ordinance as amended, unless we decide not to put an emergency clause on it, in which case we will move it to yet another reading. So with that, we'll move to the amendments that were motioned and seconded last week. I will briefly review what they were. Uh, the first was Ryan number one. That was a motion to make the following adjustments to the supplemental budget as filed to add the position of urban forest pest and pathogen specialist. Is there any additional business on this particular amendment? Uh, with that, uh, Please call the roll on Ryan number one. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment passes. The next one was what we designated as Wheeler one, the amendment. It's a motion to make the following adjustments to the supplemental budget as filed to recognize supporting housing service funds which were approved by the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners for the implementation of a temporary uh, for the implementation of temporary alternative shelter sites. Is there any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, please call the roll on Wheeler one. Aye. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Maps. Aye. <laughs> Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment passes. Then there was MAPS amendment number one. It was a motion to make the following adjustments to the supplemental budget as filed to appropriate one-time general fund discretionary resources in the commissioner's offices. Is there any further discussion of this amendment? Seeing none, please call the roll. MAPS. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. So uh, just briefly, as a reminder, bureaus are required to prove their encumbrance requests, and it is required that they demonstrate that they are tied to real costs incurred, and that is as per council fiscal policy. Council offices, in my opinion, have not provided clear uses for this funding that are not already covered by other funding buckets, for example, compensation set aside. Moreover, I can't support withholding $500,000 from a contingency fund that helps us mitigate very real revenue shortfalls within our city, uh, in our safety bureaus, in particular police and fire over time. Therefore, I vote no, but the amendment does carry. And at this time, I will ask, uh, are there any new amendments that council members would seek to propose? I have one. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. I offer the following amendment for consideration by my colleagues. As has been communicated to your staff, there was an accounting error related to cannabis funds that Prosper caught, and we are cleaning that up in, in the core ordinance. And the addition of this amendment makes it clear that investments will be made with the approximate $365,000 in funds. So in full, the amendment reads, Motion to add the following directive in the fall supplemental budget as filed to direct Prosper Portland to reprogram cannabis fund resources away from the seed program. The fall supplemental budget as filed includes an allocation of $364,159 in resource from the Recreational Cannabis Tax Fund 
originally allocated by the Council to the Office of Community and Civic Life for seed grants to be used for the Inclusive Business Resource Network. The IBRN program is currently funded with general fund discretionary resource in Fund 100, but the Bureau exp program expenses associated with this initiative are eligible for funding with the Regional Cannabis Re Fund Resource. This amendment will add the following directive to the fall supplemental ordinance. The council directs Prosper Portland to reprogram the $364,159 from the Recreational Cannabis Fund originally allocated by the council to the Office of Community and Civic Life for seed grants to be used for the Inclusive Business Resource Network in Prosper Portland's Recreational Cannabis Fund budget. The $364,159 in general fund discretionary resource will be reallocated to support business incubator activities, downtown event activation, and the local movie production industry. Update exhibit one through five as needed to reflect this change. I'll second that. We have a motion from Commissioner Rubio, we'll call it Rubio one, and we have a second from Commissioner Maps. And uh, is there any further discussion or questions on this particular amendment? I just have a brief one. I just want to clarify. There, so there, overall, there's no fiscal impact. There's no, no yes, encumbrance right. impact. It is a reallocation yes. to make sure that, that we understand that the seed grants are going towards IBRN, yes. the Inclusive Business Resource mm -hmm. Network. Very good. Uh, is there any public testimony on this amendment? No one signed up. Please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment passes. And then with that, I will uh, ask if there are any other amendments that people would like to add at this particular time. So colleagues, uh, at this point I would ask, is there, um, could you just signal whether or not you would support the addition of an emergency clause? Yes. Very good. I would move then a motion to amend the fall bump ordinance to add an emergency clause in order to have the appropriations in exhibits one through five of this ordinance is amended to be enacted upon unanimous passage of the ordinance. Can I get a second, second. please? Second. Commissioner Ryan seconds. Any further discussion? Any public testimony? Please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. So that amendment passes. Uh, I would then like to start off by, uh, well, I'll, I'll do it during my voting remarks. At this point, we'll vote on the ordinances amended. Any further discussion before we get to the vote? Please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. I just want to thank Budget Director Tim Grew and the entire City Budget Office for your tireless work on this budget process. I vote aye. The emergency ordinance passes as amended. And now we'll transition to the Cannabis Fund Ordinance. Can you please read item 866? Update the fund statement of purpose for the Recreational Cannabis Tax Fund to allow the City Budget Office to establish set-aside funds for an operating reserve policy. Colleagues, as part of last week's fall bump hearing, CBO overviewed an ordinance that updates the fund statement of purpose for the Recreational Cannabis Tax Fund to include a reserve requirement. In this case, it's 10%. As you know, my proposed fall supplemental budget implements a brief one-time cut in cannabis resources to Prosper Portland. After Prosper Portland is made whole from this cut, pending forecasts, the city will begin to establish a 10% reserve for this fund to mitigate potential cash management issues and to protect against flagging revenues in this market. Is there any dis additional discussion on this item? Would uh, you signal again if you'd uh, allow me to add an emergency clause? Very good. Uh, please, uh, I move an emergency clause. Second. Be added for the same reasons. I have second. a second from Commissioner Maps. Any further discussion? Please call the roll on the amendment. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The amendment is adopted. And uh, then to the main motion, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add as a budget office before no, we sir. take a vote? We're Please fine. call the roll on the motion as amended. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. 
Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Wheeler. Thank you, everybody. I vote aye, and we are adjourned. Thank you.